Man, that pumpkin spice cold brew from Starbucks is absolutely brilliant. It's brilliant. I wish I would have came up with the idea myself. I'd be rolling in the millions right now. I don't know how you go to Starbucks and not order that beverage. I mean, look at this. Look at this top. If you guys can see that. All I have on that top, it is very tempting for me not to take this lid off and lick all of it. And in fact, I might do that after I finish this open. It's nothing but pumpkin cream, cinnamon, nutmeg, and whatever fall seasonal spice that they got. Unbelievable stuff. Love pumpkin. Love pumpkin season, man. I am a pumpkin. My middle name is pumpkin. But I'm not here to talk about pumpkins. I'm here to talk about a different type of season. And that is the pro wrestling season going on into the fall. Specifically on Wednesday nights. The Wednesday night wars between AEW and NXT. I want to use an analogy with this whole pumpkin theme. Say, for example, you're baking a pumpkin pie. Hmm. The aroma of that pumpkin pie, so tantalizing, so delicious. You pull it out of the oven, and it looks like an award-winning pie that you'd see on the Food Network, right? Look like It looks like something Martha Stewart would bake in all its perfection. But what's in the context of this pie? What is in the center of this pie? Is it... Is it something that is sweet and just unbelievable? Is it going to melt in your mouth? Is it going to be the most delicious thing that you've ever tasted in your entire life? Or is it going to be baked by some fucking geek at the local supermarket who doesn't know anything about bacon and just wanted to make a nice presentation and put it on sale for about $14.99? But what's in the pie? What is in this pumpkin pie that's going to make it that much more attractive? and beautiful, and delicious. You see, I look at the Wednesday Night Wars as a big pumpkin pie. You got AEW, and you got NXT, but what is in the center? What is it at its core? What is the Wednesday Night War? Why is it happening? Nobody in the community seems to either know the answer, or they do, and they're playing stupid, and they refuse to be truthful with their audience. You see, this is why I don't listen to many people in the community because, honestly, I think most of the community are a bunch of blithering idiots. Now, they might think the same thing about me because of my outlandish opinion, but nobody can refute the fact that I'm just more intelligent than most people in and around the community, especially with what we do here. Nobody wants to give you and uncover the truth about anything that's going on. Now, there's a reason why I say that, because I guarantee you the reason that I'm giving you, nobody else is going to give you. Now, this was very apparent by what we've seen on Wednesday. NXT had a great show. AEW had a great show. Now, NXT was a great show. AEW was a great show, but with things that they need to work on. It wasn't the most perfect show, but as far as a debut episode, I could not be happier. They will learn along the way. We expect greatness from NXT because that's all they've given us. They have a track record to prove it. They have a roster to prove it. They have a payroll, just like AEW does, a payroll to prove it. Now, Wednesday, everybody was watching with bated breath. Who's going to win? Who's going to win the Wednesday Night Wars? Is it going to be AEW? Is it going to be NXT? What the ratings are going to be? I'm enjoying this. It's so great to be a wrestling fan. (laughs) You know, that's all people were saying. Watching it duel, you know, at the same time, watching NXT on USA Network on one TV, and they got another TV hooked up watching AEW. I can't do that. I can't do that. Now, what I did is I watched AEW live, recorded, worked, uploaded, watched NXT right before I went to bed that same night, woke up the next morning, recorded, and boom, I'm good to go. People are breaking down segments. People are comparing segments. People are going over the the positives and the negatives of each show. Listen, you enjoy the shows or you don't enjoy the shows. Don't give me... All this bullshit because you want to make a bigger deal about something that really isn't a big deal. There is one big deal, but it has nothing to do with AEW and NXT and the ratings. Now, Wednesday night came. 
Thursday morning, we all woke up. With bated breath, we all wondered what the ratings were going to be. And on Thursday afternoon, the rap gives us the ratings. Dynamite Drew. Dynamite Drew. 1.4 million viewers. 1.4 million viewers for their debut episode. That blew expectations out of the water. Everybody that sat behind a microphone that has a podcast said, you know what, I don't see AEW doing 500, 600,000. You know, that's about the minimum that they'd get. Nobody really predicted that AEW would do over a million. It was too far-fetched to say, ah, I don't think AEW's going to do over a million. Let's see how they perform first, and maybe they'll grow their audience to get to that big number, that big threshold of a million. I didn't even go out there and predict AEW to do a million. Now, I would not have been surprised if the number came back, and when I read this, I was not surprised at all that AEW did over a million. There's a reason why they did over a million. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but I wasn't going to go out there and give them this lofty expectation, and then when they didn't meet it, then people would come to me and say, oh, AEW sucks, or AEW's a failure, they're going to close up shop in less than a year. This is the bullshit that I got to listen to from people who are that unintelligent. I was never going to do that. A, it's unfair of me to do that, and B... We don't know what they're going to produce. We don't know the quality of television they're going to produce. We don't know what they're working with. We don't know the direction of their TV shows on a weekly basis. We we just don't know. Now, after a month, two months, and they consistently put on great quality television and they're still maintaining this rating, then I'm not going to be surprised. But I'm not surprised, at the same time I am, that they did 1.4. What did NXT do? NXT did 891,000 on their season premiere of NXT on USA. Full two hours on USA. Not this one hour here, one hour there nonsense. Two hours. Commercial free for the first 30 minutes and limited commercial interruptions throughout the evening. WWE took every rule that they usually give you on a Monday or Tuesday and they broke them. Limited commercials. Every commercial was a picture in picture. They did literally everything to take your attention away from AEW. They even gave you a 15-minute overrun like we used to see back in the day on Monday Night Raw just so that you would say, you know what, let me tune on into NXT to see what they got going on in the last 15 minutes. Meanwhile, on TNT, they gave you immediately at 10 o'clock a replay of what started at 8 o'clock, just in case you missed it. So... They tried and tried and tried everything to take your attention away from the hype surrounding AEW Dynamite. So, 1.4 to 891,000. AEW, realistically, blows away NXT in week one. But is that the most important thing that we're going to hang our hats on here? It's 1-0 now with AEW. Are we going to be keeping score every single week? Now, if you're a fool, you're going to be doing that, but I'm going to let you know, the ratings don't really matter outside of Vince McMahon. The ratings don't matter to you and I. They don't. And I told you this from the get-go. They don't matter. Concern yourself with the quality of the show. Is AEW putting on a quality show? Yes. Is NXT putting on a quality show? Yes. That's all that should matter to you. Now, diving into the numbers. Dynamite's number was so impressive... That, like I said, people predicted 500 to 600,000 max for Dynamite. Nobody really said, you know, they're going to come out there and blow away NXT on week one. The numbers proved otherwise. In the key 18 to 49 age demographic, AEW smashed NXT, drawing 878,000 viewers compared to 414,000 that NXT had, more than doubling. NXT's audience in that same demographic. Now, funny enough, that NXT number of 414,000 is actually up 1% from what they did last week. The interesting thing is now to see if AEW, and I say this all the time, the interesting thing about this, and again, don't concern yourself with the rating. The interesting thing is, is that number going to be one4 for AEW next week. I am going to go out on a limb and say, no, it won't be. This could be week one hype and everybody tuned in to see the hype. 
Maybe next week we see that number significantly take a decline and NXT's number is raised up. Maybe people use this week as a test run and to gauge their interest. Everybody tuned in to AEW because they were the unknown. Nobody knew what they were going to do. Everybody knows the quality of show NXT puts on. Maybe this was just a situation where people gave AEW two hours of their night to see what they did. And those people wanted to make a determination at the end of those two hours if they're going to come back next week or not. Because they know exactly what NXT does. And for the simple fact that tonight, Thursday, I'm recording this on Thursday, by the way, geeks, that NXT is going to be on the WWE Network. It's going to be on the WWE Network at 8 p.m. So you have a backup. If you wanted to watch AEW on Wednesday, you could go back and watch NXT on Thursday, which is not a wrestling night anymore. There's nothing that's on Thursday night. So you could specifically make Thursday an official NXT night. I don't know what people's reasoning were. I don't know why the ratings were so high. Week one hype, the unknown, everybody excited to see what they deliver in their opening night. Yes, all of that is definitely a fact. But the fact that NXT drew 1.14 million on week one, where they gave themselves a two-week buffer on the USA Network, even though it was for one hour. NXT did 1.14 million viewers on week one to get a two-week jump on AEW, and they declined the next week and on the most important week, which was this past Wednesday on the season premiere, where they were live for two full hours on the w on the USA Network and not the WWE Network. So what does that say? Is that all AEW hype? Can't be. I'm just making a possibility out of what it could be. I don't know for sure what it is, but there's no reason if NXT was so great, why would it decline week after week after week? And in this most important week, come in at their lowest in the last three weeks. Doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't. Now, if AEW can retain this and be somewhere close to this 1.4, then we're off to the running. And that means trouble for WWE. That means trouble for NXT. Now, I don't think that the number is going to be 1.4. I would be shocked if the number is higher and continues to get higher. I, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, yeah, the number is going to be the same or the number is going to be higher. It's going to take a dip. It's going to fluctuate. And I can't sit here and say, yeah, AEW is going to have a consistent rating because we just don't know. We don't know. And it's not fair for us to determine that. Everybody goes through the ups and downs. But what I want to tell you here, the most important thing I want to tell you here, is you're getting this Wednesday night ratings war now, and everybody's making a big deal about the Wednesday night wars, and AEW's got one up on NXT. Again, it doesn't really concern you who wins and who loses. We win in the end. What I want you guys to understand is, is the reason why WWE did this. I want you to look at this 1.4 million viewers that AEW drew on Wednesday night. That's not too far out from where SmackDown has their ratings. That's not too far out from where Monday Night Raw has their ratings. SmackDown was drawing what? 1.8, 1.9? That is not far off from SmackDown Live. Monday Night Raw, what are they bringing in? 2.1 on a Monday night? In this new era? This new Paul Heyman era? That's not too too far off from Monday Night Raw either. So what does that say when AEW... And I'm not really praising AEW here, but I want to tell you exactly what is going on. Again, we don't know if AEW is going to maintain this 1.4 rating every week. It's going to dip. Some, some weeks it might be lower, some weeks it might be higher. But what does this say? If an unknown wrestling promotion comes out here and starts drawing 1.4, 1.5 ratings on night one when nobody knows what they're going to do. What does this say? If AEW could pull on this type of roster with the mentality and the sports-driven product that they have in comparison to Monday Night Raw, that is not too far off. What does that say about the WWE main roster? What does it say? It means Vince McMahon's entertainment aspect and Vince McMahon's creativity and Vince McMahon's mentality is out of touch. It doesn't matter who is in the executive director role. It doesn't. I mentioned this weeks ago. 
Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff were placed in these positions for them not to make the shows better. They were placed in those positions, and we haven't seen Eric Bischoff work yet from what I've been reading and what I've been told. Now, that might change with SmackDown moving to Fox, but Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff were put in these positions because they're not trying to make Monday Night Raw better or SmackDown Live better. They were put in these positions because Vince McMahon, and everybody knows Vince McMahon runs these shows the way he wants. He runs these shows to his agenda. He runs these shows meticulously to please himself and no one else. Not the roster, not the fans, only him. He's an audience of one. He put these men there to be meat shields. He put Heyman and Bischoff there so that when the show tanks, which they always do, just look at Monday for your latest example, the show tanked. The show was critically panned by everybody. SmackDown Live has not been good in how long? I don't even know anymore. But the reason why Vince put these guys there is to take the blame and the heat off himself. He took himself out of the kitchen. He took himself out of the creative kitchen and put Heyman and Bischoff in there so that when the shows fail and the shows bomb, who are we going to blame? Now we have a name, a face, and a title to go along with these names and faces. Now we're going to be more quick to blame them and not blame Vince McMahon because in the casual audience, if they make this thing a big deal and they get it out there to news outlets and they mention this in front of the stockholders, what does that do? Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff are now running Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live and Vince McMahon's going to take himself out of the weeds because he's got a bunch of other things to do, yet he's still there writing the show. He's still there checking off all the boxes of what he wants and what he doesn't want. Doesn't matter who's there. Vince is still to blame, but now we are more quick to judge these guys and blame these guys instead of Vince McMahon because now their names and their profiles and their titles are out in the general public. I stated this every single week when that news was breaking. That's exactly what it was, and that's exactly what it is now. That doesn't change from what he did with NXT. The reason why he put NXT on the USA Network was not because of NXT's natural growth or natural progression. NXT was moved to the USA Network because everybody knew, no matter how many times they wanted to refute the statement, AEW was always looked at as competition. Don't bullshit me! WWE is very quick to say, oh yeah, AEW is not competition, but what do you call five-year contracts? What do you call all of a sudden moving Evolve to the WWE Network to compete against an AEW show that is merely for charity? Five-year contracts. Everybody's being signed to a five-year contract. More money than they've ever seen in their entire life. Scooping up every independent talent for the sake that they don't go to AEW. And you don't have any idea what to do with half the fucking guys you have on your roster now. You want other people to bring on in. You're closing down promotions. You're pulling talent from shows so they don't go and work for somebody else. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. People in WWE are claiming that AE, AE, AEW is not competition. Or it's going to look like Impact. It's going to look like a WWE landfill. Of course you think AEW is competition. Your actions prove otherwise. Everything you've done is because of competition with AEW. Everything. Moving NXT to the USA Network was just the cherry on top of this AEW effect. WWE wasn't concerned about AEW. None of this would have happened. And I understand that everybody here is fighting for eyeballs. AEW is fighting for eyeballs. NXT is fighting for eyeballs. WWE is fighting for eyeballs. Right? I've never seen more hype and more promotion of NXT in my entire life. Now that they got moved to the USA Network and now that they're directly competing on Wednesday nights with another rival promotion, I have never seen NXT promoted as much as I do now. But when they were bringing out TakeOver after TakeOver after TakeOver and everybody was fucking praising the work of Triple H, you didn't hear a single fucking peep. You didn't hear a single peep after TakeOver New York. He didn't hear any promotion about TakeOver New York. And that was the best show that they ever put on. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. All they did was take his talent and bury them on the main roster. 
Now we're seeing NXT this, NXT that. It's the one night of the week where, you know, no rules and it's gritty and it's raw and it's pro wrestling the way it should be. Now? Now! Meanwhile, I've been watching NXT for seven fucking years. Now you want to get on the NXT bandwagon. NXT was always the true alternative to WWE. Always! All they had to do was open their eyes and look! This is what you need to do! And AEW doesn't need to show up on TNT for you to all of a sudden... Oh, we gotta do things differently. You should have been doing things differently when Triple H started doing things differently. Yet I'm told, oh, it's a niche audience. Yes, yeah, some niche audience. You got Bobby Lashley and Lana making out on Monday Night Raw. And what are they doing in the ratings? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Drawing 11 million viewers on YouTube. Of course you're going to draw 11 million viewers on YouTube. How does that translate to viewers on Monday night? It doesn't. It doesn't. You're going out there and being risque. Meanwhile, AEW put on a pro wrestling show. No matter the hype that was surrounding the debut episode, they drew 1.4 million. That's not too far off from Monday Night Raw. Now, the reason why NXT is on the USA Network is because Vince always, always, always knew AEW was going to be a legitimate threat. Tony Khan is worth $7.8 billion. That is a threat in itself. Anything that Vince McMahon can do, Tony Khan can do the same thing. Money isn't even an issue. Nothing is an issue for AEW. He has the backing of his entire family. He has great minds in AEW with Cody, Kenny, the Bucks, and everybody associated with that team. He is, right now, where he needs to be. Vince McMahon sees this, and of course he sees this as competition. They could say, AEW is not competition, we're not worried, we're not this, we're not that. Of course you are. Your actions have spoken. Your actions speak otherwise. Just like Bischoff and Heyman being put in this position and put into the public eye as the executive directors of Monday Night Raw to take the heat off of Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon was so worried about AEW coming on the scene and taking away from Monday Night Raw that he moved NXT to Wednesday nights to be a meat shield like Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff. NXT is nothing more than a meat shield. NXT is on Wednesday nights to stop the momentum of AEW. Because he knew if AEW went unopposed, what would that do? Where would all those other people be? They'd be watching AEW on Wednesday nights, wouldn't they? No matter if there was competition or not, they'd be watching AEW. You can imagine that 900,000, what would they be doing on Wednesday nights? They'd be watching AEW. And if they were, AEW would be generating a bigger rating than Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. Vince doesn't want that. Because what would that say about Vince McMahon's main roster product? What does that say about Vince McMahon's main roster product now? I know it's garbage. I know it's complete dog shit. But what would that do to Vince McMahon's ego? If NXT was not on Wednesdays live on the USA Network, if they remained on the WWE Network, what would that mean? And what would that say about Vince McMahon's main roster product if AEW went unopposed and drew a better rating on a weekly basis than both Raw and SmackDown Live weekly? That wouldn't be so good now, would it? Vince McMahon wouldn't be happy with that. So he moved NXT Live to the USA Network not to beat AEW. Vince McMahon knew moving NXT to A to Wednesday night to go against AEW was not going to result in a W for WWE. Nobody in WWE expected NXT to beat AEW. Nobody. They simply moved it. Vince McMahon made the executive decision to move NXT to Wednesday nights to bury NXT. He threw NXT under the bus he has NXT in a position now to simply calm the fire that is AEW. He doesn't give a shit if NXT wins or loses. Now NXT is, is in a position to be a blockage for AEW, and now AEW has to beat NXT to get to Monday Night Raw-like ratings. Because if NXT again was not on Wednesdays Live and remained on the WWE Network, and AEW went unopposed on Wednesday nights, what would that mean for Vince McMahon and his main roster product? What would it mean? It would be Vince McMahon shitting his pants even more than he is now, and it would damage his otherwise huge ego. This is why NXT was moved to Wednesday nights. Not because it's the natural progression of NXT. They could hide 
NXT under all this political garbage all they want. They can get you excited about the product. I was excited about the product before it made it to USA Network. You should genuinely be excited about the product regardless of what channel it's on, whether it's taped or live. The natural progression of NXT is taking what Triple H is doing and apply it to the main roster because at that point, NXT would have been a true change to the overall WWE product. All you're doing is taking AEW for what it is, a true competition, and you're burying the best thing that you have in your company right now to stop their momentum just for your own personal ego and agenda. And that is fucked up. That is completely fucked up. I will not move away from this stance. You're not going to hear this from anybody else. You can brag about the ratings, you can brag about the excitement and what it means to be a pro wrestling fan in 2019. I'm telling you right now, there is no true, genuine love coming from the WWE in this quote-unquote war. NXT was thrown under the bus to simply stop the momentum of AEW because Vince McMahon would not be able to handle AEW gaining momentum every single week where they're now inching closer and closer to the Monday night and Friday night shows. Because again, what would that mean for the main roster? That would mean Vince McMahon is losing viewers, losing money, and losing touch, which we all knew already. And on top of that, the most important thing, Vince McMahon's ego wouldn't be able to handle another rival company coming on into the game and doing something better than the man himself. That's why he put NXT in the position that he did. Now, NXT is not going to be a loser in my eyes. NXT is always, constantly putting on the best show of the week. This past Wednesday was no different. It was no different. They put on a better show than AEW. They're expected to. And again, I need to be clear with you guys. I am not pro AEW on this. I am not pro NXT. I am happy that Wednesday nights is now a night where we can sit comfortably and not complain. That's all I've ever wanted. All I've ever wanted was AEW to come on into the game and make the WWE main roster better. I don't consider this a war between NXT and AEW because they have the same fans. This, this is the same audience watching both shows. But one has to wonder, what if those 800, 900,000 people didn't have NXT to watch? What would they be doing? Clearly, you're watching pro wrestling. You'd be watching pro wrestling from another promotion. I don't understand why everybody is thinking, oh, ratings, oh, Wednesday Night Wars, oh, excitement, oh, it's good to be a wrestling fan, when deep down under it all, Vince McMahon is the puppet master and you're all dancing on his strings. NXT is being thrown to the fire, thrown to the wolves to calm the nerves of the 74-year-old CEO. That is all that's going on here. NXT is being used to stop AEW's momentum, just like Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff are being used in this executive director role when it really doesn't even exist to simply take away from who really is writing these shows. And when we are quick to blame somebody, it's not going to be Vince McMahon anymore. It's going to be Paul Heyman getting the heat. It's going to be Eric Bischoff getting the heat, just like Road Dogg put himself in the creative writer position on SmackDown. Did we all blame Vince McMahon? Or how many of us went to Road Dogg instead and sort of blasting Road Dogg and getting blocked by Road Dogg on social media after we voiced our displeasure? It's the same thing. Don't be a fool. Yeah, AEW won the ratings. Are they going to have the same rating next week? No, they won't. The most important thing here is next week. How many viewers is AEW going to lose? Then, the next week after that, and the week after that, give it till the end of October. You have a better idea of what the ratings are going to be, and then you could really sit down and think what I said here being a reality. Because this is exactly what I know is the fact. This is the truth. And at the end of the month, it's going to be even more apparent to you. AEW is no fluke. AEW getting a 1.4 rating is no fluke. I didn't expect 1.4 but I know after Wednesday night, I don't know who watched that show and isn't already excited for next week. It's a different product. It's a different world. It's a different genre now. Pro wrestling is a different genre in 2019. You can brag about Bobby Lashley and Lana getting 11 million views on their YouTube video. I don't give a shit. WWE is doing it and has been doing it wrong for years. All because you think NXT is a niche audience or AEW is a niche audience doesn't mean it isn't the right direction 
for the natural progression of pro wrestling. WWE clearly is behind the eight ball. This rating proves that to be 100% fact. If anything that needs to be changed, it's WWE, not AEW and NXT in the way that they operate. This is off the script. You want it off the script? There you go. I didn't write anything down. As soon as I seen the ratings, I knew exactly what I was going to say coming on here talking about this particular situation. And I would have waited till Tuesday because I have an AEW podcast that that goes up and it is going to go up every Tuesday. This was too big to not do here on the actual podcast. I wasn't going to wait. This needed to be heard by everybody and this needs to be on a bigger platform and just not an AEW video. This needed to be on off the script. Let me know what you guys think. This rating proves that. And we'll see at the end of the month where AEW stands. NXT might be in the millions. NXT might be in the millions on week two, week three. We don't know. But if NXT is going to maintain this rating at 891,000 after all the promotion they did on that show, which was basically a takeover show with limited commercials, and AEW had their debut episode with really not much of anything being known to anybody, what does that say? What does that say? Is it really the debut hype? Or is it really genuine interest in their overall product now? Next week is the most important aspect. Don't let what I said here sway you to think that I'm an AEW shill and now I hate WWE. I'm not siding with either one of them. The issue that I have here is Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon put NXT in this position because of his fucking desire to kill his enemy. And Vince McMahon will kill his enemy by killing the best thing that he has in his company. This is a fact. It's been done before. I would not be surprised if he does it again. This is off the script. Don't go nowhere. We got a ton of news today. We got a pay-per-view on Sunday. I'm not sure if you guys know that, but it looks like there won't be any predictions, but we'll go over Hell in a Cell and what the matches are that are advertised, and we are going to go over what Hell in a Cell could be this weekend, and I got major news on CM Punk. Do not go anywhere. This is off the script. We'll hit the intro, and I'll be right back. What is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. This is episode 294, part number one for October 5th, 2019. What an open, man. What an open. I know I'm not everybody's cup of coffee. I know that I could be a little out there at times, but I take absolutely... No detours in anything that I say. I give it to you direct and how it's supposed to be. I am not taking a step back as to what I think about the AEW NXT ratings and what I think Vince is doing with NXT. I stand behind everything that I stated 100%. And I recorded that without prior knowledge to this gem that I got. Literally, after the first 30 minutes... I went to see any last-minute changes to the news before I actually recorded the rest of the show. And I got this gem. I got this gem. PW Insider is reporting that WWE released a statement regarding the first episode of AEW Dynamite. They say this, and I quote, Congratulations to AEW on a successful premiere. The real winners of last night's head-to-head telecast of NXT on USA Network and AEW on TNT are the fans who can expect Wednesday nights to be a competitive and wild ride as this is a marathon and not a one night sprint. Seems like NXT or WWE in regards to NXT is conceding all of this pressure on Wednesday nights. It's not a one night sprint, it's a marathon. And that's exactly what it's going to be in their eyes. But I don't think AEW is going to 
let up in the ratings. I don't think AEW is going to take that big of a dent in the ratings. Clearly, it's not going to be a 1.4 like we mentioned next week. And next week is going to be the most important aspect of what we discuss as far as the ratings go. Because that's going to give you a better understanding and a better idea of how they are going to perform consistently. Like I mentioned, it could be all week one hype. It could be all week one hype. Normally with a debut episode, no matter what it is, the ratings peak. Always in week two, they dip. Always. That could be a case here. In fact, it is going to be a case. But after that, when we start to level out, that's when the consistency happens. And when they start booking shows that correlate with big storylines and big matches, then you'll see the ratings spike. NXT has dropped. NXT has dropped. No reason why. No reason why. The only thing I could surmise is everybody that normally watches NXT gave up on NXT for the night to simply check out AEW. And next week, they have made a determination. I don't like what I see here. Now I'm going to watch NXT like I usually do or plan to because I am not on board with what AEW is doing. I'm not a fan. But WWE to release this statement. I want to see some goofball. I want to see some geek in Stanford, Connecticut. Tell me and tell everybody, oh, well, you know, NXT is NXT. You know, WWE is not competition to AEW. AEW is not going to last. Of course they're competition. Of course they are competition. Don't bullshit me. I I don't understand why people are adamantly admitting that they're not competition. Why would WWE release a statement like this? This is bizarre. It's like I'm living in the bizarro world. What is this? Are you adamantly admitting? Maybe WWE got tipped off. I don't know when this statement came in, before or after the ratings, but a statement like this from WWE after they vehemently went out there and said that they're not competition. Now you're mentioning them on... Uh, on, a, on a statement? Where this statement came from? I don't know. You're admitting that AEW put on a great show. And that you're proud and, and you're excited about the Wednesday Night Wars. What are you doing? What does this even mean? It's a marathon and not a sprint. I'm sorry. I think Vince McMahon's going to be running out of, out of breath in this marathon. He's going to be gasping for breath whether he makes the finish line or not. I don't know. But AEW's in this thing for the long haul. Get used to it. And I stand behind everything I said about Vince and his willingness to risk and kill NXT at the same time just to kill his opponent. I really do. Because if Vince McMahon cared about NXT, obviously he's paying the bills over there. But Vince McMahon's got a thousand and one other things on his plate. NXT and a little show in front of 500 people at some shitty college down in Winter Park, Florida isn't really on his radar of top priorities. The talent is going to be a top priority when and if he decides to pluck them from NXT. What he does with them after the fact, that's on him. We all know the job Triple H does and the job Triple H has has done. But Vince McMahon, you can't tell me that Vince McMahon, no matter how many times Triple H comes out and states that Vince McMahon is a fan of NXT, understands the grittiness and the raw product that it is and how vastly different it is from the main roster. Why did, why, why is there such a vast difference in quality? Why is something so different compared to Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live, when you should be looking at NXT as a way to build your shows on Monday and Friday night? Because clearly you care about AEW. So why not take what he's doing and apply it there? I don't get it. You can't sit there and tell me that Vince cares about NXT. He doesn't. Because if he did, the last six years would have told a very different story. He doesn't. Now all of a sudden he cares because his brand is on the line. And AEW is threatening his brand. You can't tell me that Vince gives a shit about NXT. He didn't then and he doesn't now. Clearly. He's putting NXT at risk to kill AEW. Or try to at least. Right now, he's trying to halt their momentum. I don't understand people's logic. This statement was very weird. Very weird for them to say. 
So again, I want to see someone in Stanford, Connecticut say that AEW is not competition to WWE. When you're mentioning them by name and wishing them success on TNT, you're pretty much admitting that they're competition. Now, I don't think this is a conceding to the overall war here. Maybe WWE is saying that they got too knee-deep in this thing and they went out there a little bit too much. I I don't find that to be a natural trait of WWE. They want to kill, strike and kill immediately. You think they're going to wait around? What else could they do on NXT to take you away from AEW? What? If that show on Wednesday night didn't do it, nothing will. Nothing. You put on the very best show that you could. What are you going to do after that? What are you going to do in week three, week four, week five? That's going to top week one. It's going to be very difficult. You're going to give me a takeover show every fucking week? What happens when they lose every single week? This is another question. I don't believe I'm still talking about this. This is another question that I have to pose. You know, Vince McMahon never cared about NXT. Who's to say that in his right mind he put Triple H in this position to fail? You think, I don't know what Triple H is thinking. Triple H is going to give you the answer he's going to give you. Because he's a businessman. He works for his fucking father-in-law. He is an employee of Vince McMahon. I don't know what Vince McMahon is doing here with all this shit. I could be completely off, off base. I could be off base about Triple H. Does he care? Is this something that he's excited about? Is he going along with it because it's Vince McMahon's idea? How does he really feel if you got Triple H behind closed doors? Is he going to give you a different answer? Is Triple H completely on board with moving NXT to two hours on the USA Network? For all we know, Triple H wouldn't have moved NXT off the WWE Network and never would have put them in this position. This is all a Vince McMahon decision. Who's to say Vince didn't do this by his own snap of a finger? made Triple H to do this, and now he could throw it back. Now he has every reason in the book to throw it back in Triple H's face. Oh, look at your NXT brand. Look, they're not as great as everybody thinks they are. You can't even beat AEW. You can't even break a million viewers on season premiere week with the takeover card that you had. Adam Cole and Matt Riddle opening it up. A women's championship, a tag team championship. Every fucking championship was on the line in NXT, and you couldn't beat AEW. Who's to say Vince is not going to throw this in Triple H's face? Willingly, he risked NXT, and again, this is all going to play out much clearer over the month, but he willingly, on week one, and it's going to show itself, it shows itself now, put NXT in this position, risk them for his own ego. He put his own son-in-law on the line. What are people going to think internally about Triple H if he can't beat AEW consistently when everyone knows the product is much better than AEW. What is it going to say? You think those people internally are going to want Triple H to run the main roster when to them, if the ratings is, is everything that matters, if the ratings are all that matters and Triple H can't beat the ratings war with AEW, are these people going to want to see Triple H take over the main roster when that time comes? He's never going to get the position. So who's going to be? Who's it going to be to take over Vince's spot if it's not Triple H? This, this, I might be thinking too much into this. But man, you, you have to fucking sit down and really dive into it. That's something that no one in the community has done yet. Sugarcoating everything. Tired of it, man. This is our fucking week. This is the one thing that we look forward to. Most every week, and they're fucking killing it. They are killing it. Slowly but surely. I don't know how you don't watch NXT after all that they have done and the show that they put on over AEW. I don't. What else could they do? At this point, I don't think they could do anything else. I really don't. Man, I got so much to go over. I got so much news to go over. I'm sorry I'm talking about this, man. You, You don't know. You don't know. I went to the supermarket. I went to Starbucks. And I'm thinking about all this shit. I'm getting notifications out the ass of the ratings. And people texting me. Oh my God. Oh my God. The ratings. You're not thinking about it the way I'm thinking about it. You're looking at 1.4 versus 8 point. Uh, you're looking at it at one as at 1.4 versus 891. That's what you're looking at it as. I'm looking at it a lot deeper than just the numbers that you see 
on the screen popping out at you. You got to get with the program, man. This is Vince McMahon we're talking about. He don't give a shit about anything. All he gives a shit about is protecting his ego and protecting his fucking little precious piece of shit known as Monday Night Raw. That's all that Vince McMahon values. The flagship show of his brand that he's built for 27 years and his ego. Because he won't allow anything or anyone to damage his ego and embarrass Monday Night Raw. Meanwhile, he's an embarrassment to his own self and he's an embarrassment to the wrestling world with the product that he produces on Monday Night. I don't want to see anybody refute my statements in this video. You cannot. And what happens? This is another thing. You know, I'm recording this before SmackDown. I haven't even watched SmackDown yet. SmackDown hasn't even aired yet. And I'm recording this podcast. What happens when The Rock and Stone Cold and Ric Flair and The Undertaker and Brock Lesnar show up on SmackDown Live? I know the show on Friday is going to do monster ratings. 3.5, 3.6. They might be trending upwards towards 4. With The Rock, Dwayne Johnson showing up. What is it going to be when you don't have Stone Cold and Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan and and everybody else, The Rock showing up and Brock Lesnar's the champion and showing up once every four, four months or so? What, what, what is it going to be when Fox looks at the ratings in the middle of November after the season premiere of SmackDown on Fox happens and after the draft happens and when the draft picks and the draft... You know, the way it kind of correlates with Raw and SmackDown and the rosters are settling in on their own shows with exclusivity. And WWE is still pulling a Monday Night Raw rating of 2. Barely 2. And SmackDown's still doing 2.1, 2.2 on Fox. Well, what is WWE going to pull out of their bag of excuses to tell Fox executives? Well, you know, when Fox asks, what happened to the ratings? You, you had a 4 rating on night 1 and now you're dipping down into the into the 2s. You lost half of your viewership. What happened? And what is WWE going to tell them? Oh, sorry. Sorry, man. We don't have any top-tier talent on our shows. right? We haven't really produced a star on either Raw or SmackDown enough to bolster the ratings to where you like them. Yeah, Fox is going to figure out what's going on. The Rock drew all the ratings. And WWE, with their active roster right now, has nowhere in the same fucking stratosphere as Dwayne Johnson. It's not going to be that difficult to figure out. So what type of excuse is WWE going to give Fox when the ratings are half of what they are on Friday night at the end of October? Nobody's thinking about that though, right? Everything matters. Everything matters. You got to have yourself lined up for October 5th, uh, 4th and then at the end of October. It's going to be vastly different. Nobody's thinking that or taking that into, cons- into consideration. Come on, man. Got so much news. I- I'm, I'm, this, this podcast is all over the place, man. I am ranting, I am ranting, I am ranting, but I'm bringing you legitimate fucking concerns. I am. Because everybody wants to take the ratings as the end-all, be-all. Fuck the ratings! You gotta dive deeper into it. You gotta see what's really going on at the heart of the matter. What I brought to you today is... Quickly, follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That is on Twitter and Instagram. If you guys want to do that, it's a great way to keep up to date on the channel. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. That is a great way to keep yourself notified of when I go live with a new upload on the channel, which at this point will be seven days a week. It's going to be very stressful around here, man. So make sure you guys are in the know and make sure you guys are up to date on all the scheduling that is going to happen during the week. If you guys missed any of my videos, Monday Night Raw, you got AEW's podcast, Off the Script Elite on Tuesdays. Wednesday, we had AEW Dynamite. Thursday, We had NXT. Friday, we got SmackDown. And here we are on Saturday. Make sure you guys go and check out all those videos if you missed them. Links will be down below in the description of this video. Go and check it out and show your support for everything right here on Off The Script. And today's podcast is brought to you by the one and only harrys.com slash scripts. I want to go over Harry's with you guys, man, because I actually need to shave with Harry's. And I love when I do, man. It's like a holiday every week. Oh, it's Harry's Day. And I love the closeness. I love the smooth glide of the blade. And the one thing I really love most out of everything is when I need a new blade, I know I'm getting the best price in the industry. The low prices are what keeps me and everybody else coming back and using Harry's because it's such a quality blade. Did you guys know that humans have been shaving for over thousands of years? And the secret to a great shave, it hasn't really changed all that much. 
The ancient Greeks didn't need flex balls or heated handles, and neither do you. That's why Harry's doesn't overcharge you to add gimmicky features to their razors. They focus on delivering what actually matters, sharp, durable blades at a fair price. Now, I explained to you guys how I love the closeness of the shave. I love the fact that I have sensitive skin, and the glide of the blade has never cut me, and the price, man, it's just $2 per blade, so you're getting quality, durable blades at a great price. They cut out the middleman, manufacturing blades in their German blade factory that's been honing precision for a century, which means you get incredibly high-quality blades at factory direct prices. Harry's is also super convenient. Blade refills are delivered directly to your door on your schedule with or without a subscription, and there's no risk for trying them out. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they will give you a full refund. JD, this sounds fantastic. What happens when I use harrys.com slash script? You're going to get this, guys. A razor handle with a firm grip. Five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. Rich lathering shave gel with aloe. That's key to keep your skin hydrated. And a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy on the go. Guys, again, it's very simple. And the best way for me to explain it to you, start shaving better. There's no better product than Harry's. Harry's.com slash script. Being that I ranted for about 50 minutes of this show, breaking every aspect down of the AEW NXT Wednesday night ratings, might as well keep up with that same theme. Let's continue on with the ratings, but I'm not going to nearly spend as much time with these next couple of numbers, and we're going to move past this pretty quick because there's a ton of stuff I want to get into, and I'm thinking... Just as I am recording this, I might save the CM Punk news for Sunday because I just literally read, like, this is the one show that is just having news break as I am recording, and I hate that. I absolutely hate it. I just read on Twitter that CM Punk to FS1, CM Punk on WWE Backstage is all but confirmed. He has accepted the deal. I'm waiting on that. Because that could go very nicely at the end of my entire just mirage of notes on what he had stated on a recent podcast with Collider. And to kind of correlate with my thoughts on this situation and everything that he stated in this podcast interview with Collider. So I'm going to wait on that and we're going to dive into, I think, whatever I got here as far as the ratings go for Monday Night Raw and what we seen on Monday Night Raw and why I think it was a tragic mistake for WWE to venture down this path that they did on Monday night. Let's start with this. Nobody gives a shit about this, so I might as well get this out of the way. Total Divas. You guys know that they moved Ronda Rousey over to Total Divas, right? Yeah, because every time I look at Ronda Rousey, I see Diva. WWE is pathetic. They are pathetic that they put Ronda Rousey on their show. Total Divas returned for a ninth season this week during WWE Premiere Week. And this was on the E! Network. Nobody was watching. Were you watching? I know I wasn't. I haven't watched a Total Divas episode since season two. Nobody gives a shit. Ronda Rousey is the star attraction that the season is being built around. She's the new cast member. And even Ronda Rousey couldn't draw interest in this dying program. Season 9 premiere of Total Divas drew 252,000 viewers. This is by far the lowest opening viewership number in the show's history. That's that. So to boost ratings for an already dying program, they got Ronda Rousey. So you risked... This is what I mean. They don't give a shit. They're risking the appeal and the overall package that is the baddest woman on the planet and you're exposing that to a dying show in hopes that it rejuvenates the declining ratings. And what happened? If nobody's watching the opening season of season 9 or the opening premiere of season 9, what does that mean for the rest of season 9? Low, 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 low. There you go. Who gives a shit? Total Divas should be canceled. Nothing more than a bunch of jobbers who can't get over in the ring, 
placed on a reality TV show to give them more exposure and in hopes people care about them so that when they do come back to television, they are going to be received a little bit better and it's working out miserably. And this is the same company that booked their women's storyline in their women's divisions around storylines that happened on this show, by the way. So what happened to Total Divas? It was a complete failure. And everything regarding the show is a complete failure. I don't know what else to say. Get rid of it. Cancel it. I swear to God, I hope E-Network cancels Total Divas. It's been nothing more than a sheer embarrassment to WWE. They use it to branch out and bring in a new demographic of younger women who are into that type of reality TV show. And how many of those women, how many of those girls are watching the actual program? None. None. Because you're not featuring these women on the show, so why would they watch? You will never see Sasha Banks on this show. You will never see a Bailey on this show because they know that they will be exposed and be treated as something that they are nowhere close to being. Why risk your integrity? Why risk your character at that point? I hope this show gets canceled and season nine is the last season of Total Divas. Now, the Monday Night Raw ratings. The Monday Night Raw ratings were a little bit better than the Total Divas ratings. Now, mind you, this was the season premiere. Okay, the season premiere of Monday Night Raw. Meanwhile, it was nothing more than a sheer rerun of what we've seen in weeks prior. It was only coded with a new set and a new theme song and a new commentary team. And everybody thought there was going to be major changes because it's the season premiere. How could WWE make Monday Night Raw pale in comparison to NXT and pale in comparison to Friday Night SmackDown on Fox? Well, they did. They did. Now, Monday Night Raw in Phoenix at the Talking Stick Resort Arena averaged 2.570 million viewers, which is up from the previous week of 2.210. Now, this is the hourly breakdown. Let's start with last week. They did, in the first hour, 2.372. Second hour did 2.213. And then the third hour did 2.044. That was last week. Now, it was the same show as last week. The same show. Or the same Monday Night Raw that we've been seeing. It's been nothing but rematches. And last week, or this week, I should say, was no different than last week. Now, the only difference we got was that WWE had this hot, barbaric angle with Brock Lesnar and Rey Mysterio, which they trolled us with a dream match of Seth Rollins and Rey Mysterio, only for that match to not happen and replaced with Brock Lesnar beating up Rey Mysterio and his son Dominic, pulling him from the front row. And I questioned everybody on the Monday Night Raw review, was this angle worth ruining the entire show over? What does it really mean? In WWE land, they do this to pop a rating. They do this to pop social media retention. They do this to spark an interest for the night. And then they do this with no follow-up. Is there going to be a follow-up to this? We'll find out on Friday. I wish I was recording this after Friday so I have a better idea of where they go with Lesnar. So for all we know, when we watch SmackDown, it will have happened already. And by that time, we will have seen Rey Mysterio interfere and Brock Lesnar's match with Kofi Kingston, getting this rematch of Brock Lesnar and Kingston on the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view because they don't have anything else booked for the show. That's just me speaking before the fact of it actually happening. I don't know. We'll find out. But they did that to spark an interest and give you a talking point where they went over it in each segment of the show. They mentioned it about 16 different times At the top of the hour, they mentioned it. At 10 o'clock, they mentioned it at 9 o'clock. They hung on to it. It was the one thing that happened on the show that caught everybody's interest. So they did that to start the show to keep everybody guessing about who Seth Rollins was going to fight in the main event for the Universal title and it ended up being Rusev. And then they slip in the Days of Our Lives angle where Bobby Lashley and Lana are now a couple And everybody's wondering why Rusev just stood there and acted like a beta male cuck. Nobody knows. So instead of booking pro wrestling, WWE is booking Days of Our Lives bullshit, which drew 11 million viewers on YouTube. 
And I don't know how many of those viewers are going to watch Monday Night Raw coming up. It's a very small percentage. A lot of people will take that garbage in on YouTube without actually watching a three-hour bullshit-filled show. It's easier, easier for them to digest that shit in a 60-second clip on the YouTube channel. How many people did you really turn away by giving us this bullshit angle when all we want is Monday Night Raw to be better? How many will you stick around next week to watch Monday Night Raw? I doubt nobody will watch. Oh, I doubt anybody will be watching, rather. Worded that wrong. I doubt anybody's going to be watching at this rate. Now, hour one of this week's Raw, 2.701. Hour two, 2.592. Hour three, 2.416. So, you've seen the dip because people were losing interest, and people were losing interest because those people were smart. They realized that the show that you were getting was the same show as the week before, and the week before that, and the week before that. It was nothing more than a rehash. Now... The biggest competition that WWE faced came in the way of an NFL regular season game between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cincinnati Bengals that aired on ESPN that did 10.467 million viewers. For comparison, the same episode last year drew 2.50 million viewers for hour one, 2.325 in hour two, and 2.081 in the third hour. So they were actually up from last year as well. So not just last week, last year. Same week as well. I don't remember what happened last year at this time. The show was a complete miss outside of Brock Lesnar and then the Universal Championship cliffhanger, which we had to wait all the way until the ending to be disappointed in, and the United States Championship match with AJ Styles and, and Cedric Alexander was not bad at all either. But we had Sasha Banks and Alexa Bliss. We had Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roo versus Heavy Machinery, which is, by the way, a SmackDown Live team. Ricochet versus Cesaro again for a fourth time. AJ Styles versus Cedric, which was a decent match. Lacey Evans versus Natalia. I'm falling asleep just looking at the match on my notes. And Universal Champion Seth Rollins versus the Cuck, Rusev. So we got a pussy versus a cuck in the main event of Monday Night Raw. Man, that makes for exciting television. So WWE will attempt to maintain this viewership going into next week because we got Brock Lesnar. And we got Paul Heyman and what he did to Rey Mysterio. And then we got Lana making out with Bobby Lashley. And I would not be surprised if we see them on Pornhub after this storyline is over. Because this is what WWE has to resort to to generate an interest in their show. They got to give us tabloid garbage when all we want is professional wrestling. If AEW can pull in a number, a number with 1.4, that I can only hope will increase as the months and the years go on. What does that say about WWE's declining product? Year after year after year after year. This is the lowest bottom of the barrel year that WWE's had as far as ratings go. They've accumulated some of the worst ratings in this show's 27-year history in this year alone. So, I'm going to say what I said about AEW right here for Monday Night Raw. You want to hype it being a season premiere? Of course you're going to get people interested because you're offering them something new. And when they watch... What did you do to actually maintain people watching next week? You did nothing. Yes, a new theme song by Skiller. Yes, a new set. Fireworks and lasers and fire. And a new commentary team, which I loved, outside of Jerry the King Lawler being there, and more Dio Madden, hopefully on week two, but that doesn't make Monday Night Raw any different because the substance of the show was exactly the same as the weeks before, with no pay-per-view build for Sunday. So who the fuck in their right mind is going to watch Monday Night Raw going into next week? You made a determination on this show that you're not watching next week. So this is a season premiere that they suckered you into, just like the hype of AEW on their debut night on TNT. It's going to go down next week, depending how much we'll gauge at that moment in time. This number will go right back down to being where it is. Because WWE suckered you in with a bunch of hype, and a bunch of, oh my god, I gotta watch, what's gonna happen, it's new, it's fresh, it's exciting, what is WWE gonna do different, and then they did nothing. Now you made your determination on whether you're gonna watch next week, and that determination is, fuck no, I'm gonna go do something better. Monday Night Raw continues to fail every single week. That was one of the worst episodes of the entire year. And I seen some people on social media saying that WWE has to do what they did with Bobby Lashley and Lana. 
Why do they have to do it? Who says they have to do it? They put themselves in that position to where they have to do it because they've strayed so far from the fucking path and buried everybody and ruined all of their characters on TV to a point where nobody gives a shit about them or the show that now they have to resort to this. Meanwhile, this is not even professional wrestling. How many of you were embarrassed by what you've seen at the end of Monday Night Raw? Some of my colleagues who are very smart in the community said that that was the most just cringe-like and uncomfortable 10 minutes of a closing Monday Night Raw that they've ever seen. Ever. I I don't believe people are praising this. They have to do it? No, what they have to do is look at what's going on in the fucking wrestling world and apply that to Monday Night Raw. You know, all this entertainment bullshit, who are you appealing to? Are Are people watching the show on a weekly basis? Because if they're not, you're just embarrassing yourself on top of embarrassing your talent. How many of those people are they actually retaining on a week-to-week basis? Well, they give a shit about social media numbers, but social media numbers are not paying their fucking bills because it's not correlating in the ratings. The ratings will be right back to where they were because people were so fucking turned off and embarrassed by this garbage that all they want is wrestling. They want storytelling that fits in a pro wrestling landscape, not some Brazzers Black Raw garbage that you can find on Pornhub. God, you people are so fucking God. You make me ill. You make me physically ill if you enjoyed this shit. I'll give it a chance. Yeah, what a what a day to be Rusev, right? Rusev day. The worst day ever. Gotta be fucking him over. Gotta be that Rusev turned down a contract and told Vince he's not coming back. Lana told Vince she's not coming back. And they're burying, burying, burying him just bigger than they even anticipated. This is just a sheer burial. He's uh, He's got to be out the door. There's no way that this man is okay doing what he's doing. There's no way that woman is okay doing what they're doing. As far as I know, they're in a loving, committed marriage. Shit like this could ultimately ruin their manage, uh, marriage. And Vince will manage to break them apart. And if Vince is so upset that Rusev is not going to be loyal to him in WWE... I could absolutely see him getting back at both and putting them in a situation where they have to do this because they're told they have to do this and he will not be happy until something happens and they're separated. It's happened before. It's happened before. It's just disgusting. Monday Night Raw was complete garbage. Tabloid garbage. And it's not something that I am willing to admit I watch. I actually was embarrassed for myself. Not only the people watching me watch the show who watch me in... The podcast on Monday, I was embarrassed for myself watching that shit. And that is the end of the line. I can't sit here and say that Monday Night Raw was a season premiere at all. I said it on Monday, I'll say it again. It should be a series finale, because Monday Night Raw right now continues to be the worst garbage on television. Moving on here, man. Speaking of Bobby Lashley, and speaking of the Lana situation, we got news on this, and... Like I said, it went viral. I said 11 million. I don't know where it's at now. It's probably at like 8 million. Close to 11. I don't even know. I I honestly did not even go out of my way and check the stats on the YouTube video. After Monday, nine hours after Raw went off the air, it was already at a million plus views. I think it was like 1.5 million views on, on Tuesday morning. Huge number. Shock factor, people rather digest this shit in small 60-second intervals than watch this shit. You mean, we have to sit through three hours of Raw to see this garbage at the end of the show? Give me a break. Now, just to put it into perspective, what happened here? The Miz and Ric Flair Hogan, Miz TV segment, did 552,000 views as of Tuesday morning. I don't know where any of this shit sits now. Brock Lesnar destroying Rey Mysterio and Dominic had 1 million views, but the closing angle is by far and away the most viewed video of the WWE week on their YouTube channel. So it got social media attention. It went semi-viral. But what does that mean for WWE programming? Nothing. I think everybody's more in defense of Rusev. How could you do this to Rusev? How could you do this to Lana? This is not a proper use of the talent that you have there. And Bobby Lashley? Yeah, Bobby Lashley probably is... Suffering, the, uh, you know, is not suffering. Why would he be suffering? He's in a fucking make-out angle with Lana. Bobby Lashley is probably benefiting the most out of all this because he was as boring as fucking bathroom water 
shower water. And he's now the coolest guy in all of WWE. What guy on this planet would not want to be Bobby Lashley in that situation? You're probably 13 years old, 15 years old or whatnot, and you're fucking triggered that Bobby Lashley is making out with Lana. They're touching each other, and she's got his le- she's got her leg propped up on him, grinding into him, right? Bobby Lashley was the coolest motherfucker in all of WWE. It made for a garbage angle and a garbage show, but Bobby Lashley making out with Lana went viral. He's the coolest guy in WWE. A former WWE writer admits, without actually admitting, that Bobby Lashley, Lana, and Rusev, the angle at the end of Monday Night Raw, fucking sucked. A former writer of the company. This is not some fan. This is not some social media mark. This is not some company insider or business insider, industry insider. This is a former writer of the show. Tom Cassiello was a writer for WWE back in April of April of 2011 to December 9, 2016. April 17th, 2011 to December 9, 2016. He was obviously tuning in to see what WWE pulled out for their season premiere, just like everybody else. But like most fans, he didn't see this one coming. Nobody's seen this coming. The former WWE writer, who also credits himself for working on Days of Our Lives. So there you go. One life to live, and as the world turns. So he was a soap opera writer for most of his career. He said this while putting a bunch of laughing out loud crying emojis. Y'all can't point a finger at me for this one. End quote. Look at that. A former WWE creative writer is sitting at home watching this shit and pinpointing this as being garbage without actually saying it's garbage. You can't blame me for this one, man. What are we blaming you for? You're looking at all the backlash on social media and you're fucking thrilled as a pig in shit that you are not a part of this fucking creative team. Now, I still don't know who came up with this shit. A lot of you guys were like, oh, it's Vince. A lot of you guys were like, JD, don't discredit Paul Heyman. He loves this tabloid fucking risque garbage. Whoever it was should be fucking ashamed of themselves. And if it's Paul Heyman, even more so. Even more so. This, listen, Paul Heyman has to be the dumbest fucking idiot on the Raw roster, if he thinks this is going to get over in a meaningful, fucking, fruitful way that's going to keep people's interest for the long haul on Monday Night Raw. This was done because Vince McMahon loves this shit. So what did I say before? Paul Heyman is not writing the show to better the show. Paul Heyman is writing the show for Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon trusts Paul Heyman a little bit more every week when Paul Heyman continues to do Vince McMahon's bidding and continues to put shit on the show that Vince McMahon is going to give thumbs up approval to. Because if Paul Heyman's a good little boy, Vince McMahon is going to have no problem leaving him in charge of the show when he has to go do an XFL thing or if he wants to take a week off or he wants to go on vacation or this and that. He wants to step away. He wants to go fucking suck Kevin Dunn's fucking beaver, right? He can step away and be in comfortable fucking fashion knowing that Paul Heyman's gonna write the same show that Vince would write. And Vince don't need to be there if he's got Paul Heyman manipulated to that point. It's all a diversion, folks. Again, it's all a diversion. Paul Heyman must be the most gullible fuck. They must be paying him so fucking good. Must be one gullible motherfucker to know that everybody's looking towards him to make this show better. And yet, If he's a part of that angle, if that was his idea and Vince approved it because Vince is a trashy fucking guy, what does that say about Paul Heyman's true initiative on Monday Night Raw? That's not making the show better. In fact, you're making the show a complete embarrassment to watch. I am not releasing my stance on this. Until someone proves me wrong on that, I will not offer anybody a fucking apology and I will not remove my stance on what I think of how Vince operates and how Heyman's operating and what Vince really thinks of NXT. I'm not. I'm not. I don't trust Vince McMahon at all. Vince McMahon is never for the people at all. Vince McMahon doesn't give a shit about anybody but himself. So, Tom Cassiello, you can't you can't point the finger at me for this one. Yeah, yeah, but Vince certainly wants you to point the finger of blame to Paul Heyman because if Paul Heyman wasn't the executive director, who would we be blaming Vince McMahon? Now that Paul Heyman's got a title and now a face and everybody knows who he is and what type of power he has, We're more apt to blame Paul Heyman and not Vince McMahon anymore, even though he's still the man that gives the paychecks out at the end of the week. Sure. Moving on here, man. Speaking of this weekend, off the script is hot and heavy this weekend. Not sure if you guys know that 
There's a pay-per-view this weekend. There is a pay-per-view this weekend, and nobody knows what the hell is going on with Hell in a Cell. Now, there's only three announced matches. I'm sure we're going to get more on SmackDown Live, and obviously this is happening after SmackDown Live. This is being recorded before SmackDown Live, so I don't know what they're going to announce on SmackDown Live. But all I know is that there's three matches on the show. Bray Wyatt versus Seth Rollins inside Hell in a Cell. Don't know what you want me to go over here. I would like to do a section of the podcast where I go over preview and predictions, but there's nothing to preview and there's nothing to predict. There really isn't. Seth Rollins versus Bray Wyatt inside the Hell in a Cell. If you guys have been watching me for the last couple weeks, Seth Rollins is a P-U-S-S-Y, and Bray Wyatt, the Fiend, is the best thing on WWE television. Which one would you choose to win the Universal Championship and walk out of Hell in a Cell as Universal Champion? Seth Rollins has been beaten down and made into a blithering, scaredy cat pussy. This guy sucks. The current version of Seth Rollins is the worst version of Seth Rollins. I don't know who this man is anymore. This guy was fucking on top of the world last year, and he's fallen off faster than I could ever remember anybody falling off. It's not the fact that I am now against Seth Rollins because it's cool to hate Seth Rollins like it was cool to hate Roman Reigns. They are pushing him down our throats, and they're coming off with Rollins. He's coming off as one of the biggest fucking pussies I could ever remember. He's unnatural. His delivery sucks. He sucks as a baby face. He sounds and looks nothing like the Rollins of old. He looks like a suck-up, right? Having him stand there and literally kissing Hogan's ass, just like he did with DX when they had him do the you know, the DX crotch chop and had him do the DX catchphrase. The guy is nothing more than a fucking pale in comparison athlete. He looks like a fanboy more than a universal champion. Randy Orton so much had to go off the script. And if you didn't think that was off the script, you, you got another thing coming. Randy Orton completely went off key and told Seth Rollins, listen to me. If you can find your way out of Hogan's ass, listen to me because I got a few things to say. Said that on Monday Night Raw. Rollins has looked like a complete fucking failure. A failure. And I don't know what else to say. The guy cuts a promo. He's complete garbage. The guy sounds unnatural. He doesn't sound believable at all. Anything the guy says, I, I just mute the TV. Because everything that comes out of his mouth is not resonating with the audience. I've said these things over and over and over again, which I'm sure he's heard me say countless times, which has led him to being you know, a pussy, and blocking me on social media, just like he deleted his Twitter account for about a day because he couldn't handle the Sasha Banks fans. Stay off social media, bro. Stay off social media. I get more hate than I'm sure you do. And you were the one to delete your social media. Idiot. Seth Rollins is not winning the Hell in a Cell. You're not booking Bray Wyatt inside Hell in a Cell and having him lose. WWE should stay away from fuck finishes. WWE is putting a structure like Hell in a Cell around these two guys. There's one way in and no way out. Unless WWE wants to give us, you know, traditional Hell in a Cell fuckery. Somebody rips the door off. Braun Strowman wants to get his revenge on Bray Wyatt then, right? But where was he on Monday? We didn't see him on Monday. Was he selling the effects of the mandible claw? Poor Braun Strowman. Now he wants to show up at Hell in a Cell and ruin what everybody wants to see happen. Seth losing. No fuckery. None. One way in for Wyatt. One way out for Wyatt. That as That is as Universal Champion. Rollins, don't give a shit what you do with him. Don't give a shit. Here's a hint. Turn him heel. Because he sucks as a babyface. So Bray Wyatt, I got winning the Universal Championship. Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch... For the Raw Women's Championship, Sasha is a newly contracted woman. Newly contracted woman. I can only hope it's not for five years. I wish I could find out some way. I would shake that woman's hand if she didn't sign a five-year contract. So, Sasha is a newly contracted woman. I believe she had a two-year deal on the table still. WWE, I don't know what they did as far as her contract, but I can... Rest assure you, she's making much more money than she did before. Enough money where she don't have to worry about money for a very long time. Her family will be just perfectly fine. So, Sasha Banks and all of her hard work is paying off. And, you know, I, I don't know what the situation is. 
she did come off a little hypocritical. And her stance on everything, you know, is now being looked at as, you know what, you know, she could be a sellout. Some people are calling her a sellout. Some people are calling her a hypocrite. Uh, until the true story comes out, we don't know. We don't know. So it's not it's not even in my right my right mind or in my lane to say something that I really don't know much about. And I hate talking about money or contracts with anybody because it's honestly none of my business. But Sasha Banks is obviously with the WWE for a lot longer than we had originally planned or hoped for. And she's in interview saying that she's got certain perks and that Vince McMahon has given her a private jet or she's allowed to ride on the private jet with Vince McMahon, that she's closer to Vince McMahon. Now, I'm taking this to be all a part of Sasha's character, but if she's saying it like that, I would not doubt that that stuff is true. If if Sasha signed the new deal, I guarantee you that woman was given perks. I know she went in there prepared. She knew what she wanted. She got some certain perks. Maybe she got a couple of title reigns out of it. You know, promises that they're going to treat her better, this and that. The women's division as a whole, better. But she's like, I'm riding private jets. I got the big paycheck. I'm Vince McMahon. And, you know, I'm with Vince McMahon. I'm closer to Vince McMahon than I was before. I think all that stuff is true. She wouldn't say it, you know, if it wasn't true. She's in character, but I think that's the kind of thing that she really lobbied for. You know, she wanted to be taken care of a little bit better than she was before. She wanted to be treated as an equal to Becky and and Charlotte and, and, and everybody else that they favor. Because you've seen Sasha Banks really wasn't favored at all in WWE. They, they really treated her as an afterthought. They never really gave her any preferential treatment. They looked at her as like, yeah, valuable, because she's got 5 million social media followers, and they know for a fact that if she goes anywhere, she could be an absolute game changer. They know this. They didn't want her to go anywhere. She wasn't going to sit out her contract. Because if she sat out her contract, WWE has it within their power to add time on top of her contract. They would have never let that woman out now that AEW's in the game. Who knows that WWE would have ever let Sasha out. They would have held that woman captive until she couldn't wrestle anymore. They would have never let her go. They would have absolutely done everything that they could to not let that woman wrestle anywhere after WWE because of what she did to break their contract. So, I'm assuming that WWE did something to help Sasha Banks along the way, make her some new promises, work out her deal, and now she's treated as an equal, as she should, because of all the hard work that she's done. And you got to look back at what Sasha Banks has meant to this division. She is one of the primary reasons why the women's division is looked at as a game changer in pro wrestling. Uh, Women's wrestling in general as a game changer in the industry. Not only in WWE, because they're doing it all wrong, but... She is the pinnacle of where women's wrestling is and where it is right now and how important it is in WWE. It's because of her and Bayley, you know? Sasha's coming back. She hasn't lost yet, and I don't think she loses at Hell in a Cell. I think Becky right now as challenger would be much better as far as, I would say, interest on television. Sasha's got to win. Sasha's got to win the championship. This is her match. I think you give her... A win over... Who, who won that match at uh, Hell in a Cell the first time? Was it Charlotte beating Sasha, I believe? I don't even remember. I have to look it up now. This is how far out. This is how much I legitimately don't care. I have to look it up. Charlotte, bear with me, for Sasha Banks. Sasha, if I could fucking type, Banks, right? Hell in a Cell 2016. So, we got... Ooh, let's see here. Let's see. Uh, go to Wikipedia. That's the easiest thing to do. Charlotte defeated Sasha Banks. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I would say give Sasha Banks a victory inside Hell in a Cell. And I would say make her the champion because at this point, she's fresh off a new contract. She's fresh off a hiatus. You give her the championship in this situation. There's really nobody else that's going to fuck this match outcome over. Nobody's getting in. Nobody's getting out. The only one that's getting out is the winner of this match. Sasha wins it. She's the new Roman champion. Becky, for all we know, she could be moved to SmackDown Live. There's been a ton of rumors that Fox wants who they want. Becky Lynch is the most popular female not named Ronda Rousey on the active women's roster. They want Bray Wyatt. They want Brock Lesnar. Ronda Rousey's not coming back yet. She's probably not going to be back all year. So if Fox wants a female face on their brand, they want the number one female face. Becky Lynch. 
is moving to SmackDown. That's what's being reported. So if that's the case, clearly Sasha's going to win. And if Becky is not moving to SmackDown Live, I say still Sasha needs to win. Because in that case, if Becky's moving to SmackDown, fresh start, Sasha can own her division. She could be champion, run the division the way she wants. She could be the priority in that division. If The only question is who they're going to feud her with. God forbid it's uh, somebody else that we don't really approve of. At this point, I don't even know. I don't even care. But I would say move Asuka over there. Give Sasha and Asuka a main title program on Monday Night Raw. They would, they would kill it. They would kill it. So if Becky doesn't move, I say Sasha wins. If Becky does move, I don't know who Becky's feuding with on SmackDown Live. They just simply want her because she's the most over in the company as far as women go. If Becky does stay, I think it's going to do her good to chase and have Sasha be the champion. Because Becky, honestly, in my eyes, has kind of lost some steam. She's really lost a lot of fan interest, I think. She's still Becky. She's still doing what she needs to do. She's still coming off the same way that we all expected her to. She's with a caliber opponent now in Sasha Banks. And I feel that if she is chasing, it's going to heat her up a little bit more. So we'll see what happens as far as that goes. I'm going with Sasha. I'm going with her as the new Raw Women's Champion because it needs to happen for more reasons than one. And then we got the tag team match. We got Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns versus Eric Rowan and Luke Harper. This is the culmination of this Scooby-Doo storyline that we've seen on SmackDown Live. WWE has really dragged this out to a point where I don't think as many people care about it now as they did then. But the interesting thing is, Brian is still coming off as a heel. Brian is now getting yes reactions and babyface reactions. And I don't know what is going on with all this. Roman Reigns by association with a babyface Daniel Bryan. Maybe they want Roman Reigns to be in that and get a positive reaction feeding off of Daniel Bryan. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to go all conspiracy theory on you, but I don't know. Eric Rowan and Luke Harper, it is very simple. You got these two back together. First of all, you brought Luke Harper back at Clash of Champions. You paired him with Eric Rowan. They, they are not really looked at as a serious threat because nobody ever really looked at them as a serious threat. They came back to TV. Eric Rowan was placed with Daniel Bryan. It was working good for a little bit. Then they split him away from Daniel Bryan, thinking that he's going to be a successful heel on his own. They brought back Harper to pair with Rowan because they look better together than they do separately. And in this case, it works better for them to be a duo in this situation. But I can't see them losing. If they lose to Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns, where do they go from here? I don't get it. And the Usos, the Usos are yet to be on television after their small hiatus. I think Rowan and Harper win. And Daniel Bryan turns on Roman, revealing one big master plan that Bryan was in on it the whole time. He acted aloof. He didn't act, you know, he acted the best that he could. He faked everything, took a beating for the sake of protecting his guys. And at the end, all you got to do is have Brian tease a tag and then kind of walk away and stretch and do something to hell in a cell. Maybe Roman goes for a hot tag and Daniel Bryan decides to tie his shoe or something. Something along those lines. Something that a heel would do to give you a hint that something's up here. That Brian is not with Roman. He's with Harper and Rowan. That's what I would do. It makes sense going on into the Survivor Series as well. Brian could be revealed as the master fucking puppet master here. Join Harper and Rowan. You bring the Usos back. You team the Usos with Roman. And then you have a three-on-three at the Survivor Series. You got team fucking... Uh, I don't know. What do you call them? Team Earth? You know, team Better Planet? You know? Team Recycle? Versus... The Usos, the Bloodline, and Roman Reigns works out. I don't see. I don't see what you get if Rowan and Harper lose this. Where do they go? If Brian and Roman win, the storyline's over, and then Harper and Rowan have nothing to do, and they remain on SmackDown Live because you're not moving them to Monday Night Raw. Or if you want to just end this all and move them to Monday Night Raw and get them away from each other, it is what it is. It works out better if Brian turns because not only do you get that six-man tag. But you get Roman versus Brian 
And then you get the Usos versus Harper and Rowan, which could lead to a great series of matches over the Tag Team Championships. Because that's what you should have in mind. Build the Tag Team Championships or the Tag Team Division up with two competitive teams like that. The Usos are over enough where Harper and Rowan will benefit from that. And they will be over because they're going to deliver like they always do against the Usos. And then you get Brian and Roman out of it. And you got a great classic one-on-one confrontation between heel Brian and babyface Roman. Brian is so good as a heel that he will get Roman over as a babyface. And the back and forth that those two can have. Man, it's endless. You can have fun with that. You know? Brian at the top of his fucking career was the man. And that took away from Roman. Because when Brian got hurt and then Brian came back, everybody still wanted Brian and not Roman. They could play into that and make it a real good, real life engaging storyline that plays off truth. We'll see what happens. But that's all I have for Hell in a Cell. There's only three matches announced. There's only three matches announced and I don't even know where to go as far as what to predict about the rest of the show. I'm assuming I can only gauge from what I see. We could probably get a Baron Corbin versus Chad Gable rematch again if they want to do that. We could get a possible War Raiders, Viking Raiders, Ivar and Eric, the Viking Raiders versus Ziggler and Rude, being that they beat the OC twice, and I'm sure that is going to put them in line for a tag team title match. We could have that. We could get Bailey and Charlotte on SmackDown Live, even though Charlotte hasn't done anything to get another title shot. But she could realistically be... Given one, based on the actions of Bailey at Clash of Champions, they could do that. Or, WWE could go out of the box and give us Bailey versus Candice LeRae at Hell in a Cell. Candice LeRae, isn't she on NXT? Well, yeah. But Bailey was watching NXT. She was watching Candice and Shayna kill it on NXT season premiere on the USA Network. She says this on Twitter. I, Candice LeRae... I sat in a crowd watching you as a teenager and a fan. I've stood on the ring apron as your tag team partner. I've stood across the ring from you as an opponent. But my favorite will be tonight watching you as your friend on NXT USA Network. Hashtag NXT Women's Championship. And then she goes on to say, well, damn. Also, I don't have a match at Hell in a Cell. How about another title match for you? End quote. I'm down. I'm down. Nobody in the Hell in a Cell arena, wherever it's taking place, I don't even know. Nobody at Hell in a Cell is probably going to know who Candice LeRae is, but guarantee you it would be better than another match with Charlotte or another match with fucking, God forbid, somebody else on the main roster, Ember Moon. Bailey legitimately has no opponent. She's been mixed in with Alexa Bliss, Nikki Cross, Sasha Banks, Charlotte. Sasha's got Becky. The tag team champions got nobody. You can't give Alexa Bliss a title match. You can't give Nikki Cross a title match. It wouldn't make sense. Charlotte's the only other one based on the aspect of what happened at, Hell in a, uh, at Clash of Champions for a title match at Hell in a Cell. Why not go outside the box? Why not go with Candice LeRae? I don't know. We'll see what happens. But Bailey right now doesn't have an opponent for Hell in a Cell. AJ Styles and the United States Championship, he vanquished Cedric Alexander. There's no more matches. As of right now, AJ has no opponent. For the United States Championship. Might as well give him the night off. Got that nice perk in his contract. Limited dates. AJ at Hell in a Cell is not going to make the show better. And if he's not there, it's not going to make the show worse. It doesn't matter. He vanquished Cedric. I can only imagine that Cedric has nothing more to do on Monday Night Raw. They might move him to SmackDown Live via the draft. We might get uh, Brock Lesnar versus Kofi Kingston in a rematch from Friday Night SmackDown. Depending on if we see Ray or not. The WWE could book a fuck finish with or without right. We might get a rematch at Hell in a Cell. Just to boost ticket sales, because what I've heard and read that Hell in a Cell's ticket sales are atrocious right now. But if that was the planned match, you know, WWE's got two days to get people in the door to advertise Brock Lesnar having a rematch with Kofi Kingston on Sunday night following the SmackDown premiere on Fox Friday night. The... Tag Team Championships on SmackDown Live. There's really nobody in contention for the Revival. They haven't built up anybody. I don't even know why this pay-per-view is happening. Why is Hell in a Cell even a thing at this point? I don't know. I don't really understand this. In fact, WWE should look at themselves and be like, you know what? We should have put all of our thought into this week, WWE Premier Week. We don't need a pay-per-view. In the form of Hell in a Cell. They have a pay-per-view. 
in October. It's called Crown Jewel, and it's happening on October 31st. So why don't we just put all of our resources into Friday Night SmackDown and NXT and Monday Night Raw? Make them pay-per-view quality shows. We don't have to bust our ass and stress over the fact that we got to book a show on Sunday. Why don't you just book what you got to do for SmackDown and then continue booking for the Saudi show, Crown Jewel? It would be a lot easier. I I don't understand the logic here. Not only that, you're not selling tickets to this show. Nobody gives a shit. It's going to be one of the lowest viewed pay-per-views of the entire year for WWE because you haven't put anything into it. There's been no build. The build has been non-existent on TV. So what are you doing to get people excited about this? Everybody's worried about SmackDown. Didn't you think about this? You might as well have just gotten rid of it completely. When you got the date for SmackDown on Fox, you should have just canceled Hell in a Cell. You don't mind canceling a fucking house show. Hell in a Cell is looking like a house show. Get rid of it. I would have had these matches in some form or fashion on a major show like SmackDown. The outcomes happen on SmackDown or Raw. And I would have had all the build for the crown jewel happen after all this week was over. But that's just me, man. I'm just some goon who lives in his quote-unquote mother's basement and complains about WWE. But what the fuck do I know? What do I know, man? I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Finally, guys, we're going to end with this. We're going to end with this because I have sat here for a little bit now. We're almost two hours in. Hopefully, you got a decent fill of off the script. We're going to save Phil Brooks for tomorrow. Mick Foley changed his mind on Hell in a Cell. Apparently, he thought that Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks should close the pay-per-view. He says, personally, I would like to see Becky Lynch for Sasha Banks close main event Hell in a Cell. I think they deserve it. And have the potential to create something really special on Sunday. Let me know what you think. End quote. Yes, they do have something that they could potentially create and have it come out special. But that doesn't mean it needs to be in the main event. Now, he goes on to say this following that original tweet. After reading 200 plus messages and thinking about the momentum Bray Wyatt has going into the match, I have to agree that a Fiend versus Rollins Hell in a Cell main event makes the most sense. End quote. Really, Mick? Maybe all those chair shots to the head are finally getting to you. I love Sasha and Becky Lynch, but there is no way that that match is closing the show. Stop trying to force an agenda on the WWE when we all know for a fact that The Fiend is their top priority right now, and putting The Fiend anywhere outside the main event is a mistake. And the more we see shit like this being said, the more people are going to shit on him because The Fiend has become one of the most beloved acts in all of WWE. And the fact that it's happening in the main event, it is going to lend to Bray Wyatt even potentially more winning the Universal Championship. Because if it happened in the middle of the show, I don't sense that happening. I sense WWE going with the fuck finish. So the fact that it's happening in the main event, I'm happy to see it. And it makes me a little bit more comfortable that Bray Wyatt's going to walk out as the Universal Champion. Bray Wyatt, Seth Rollins, no matter how much I dislike Seth Rollins right now, is the main event of this show. Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks should open the show. You want to start off hot? You only got two Hell in a Cell matches. Open that and bookend the main event with Wyatt and Rollins. Simple. Start off hot and epic. There you go. And then you got your other match. You plug it right in between. WWE has the beginning, the middle, and the end for this pay-per-view. And everything else, fill in. I don't give a shit. Nobody gives a shit. We just want to be entertained. So that's all I got to say on that. Guys, I'm getting out of here. Thank you so very much for joining me right here on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of the NXT thoughts on the ratings and Vince McMahon and what I think of Vince McMahon and him using NXT in this format, the AEW ratings. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you think of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. Are you excited about it? And everything that we talked about here on Off the Script. Lana, Bobby Lashley, Rusev. Let me know what you guys think about that as well. If you enjoy the video, hit that thumbs up. I would appreciate it if you'd hit that thumbs up. Make sure to follow me on social media at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. And if you guys missed any of the other videos that I've uploaded already on the channel, including Raw, NXT, SmackDown Live, and AEW on Tuesday and Wednesday, the podcast, Off the Script Elite, and the AEW Dynamite Review, everything you need, everything, is linked down in the description. Click the link, easy access for you guys, and it'll take you right to those specific videos. I will be back on Sunday. Yes, we got Hell in a Cell on Sunday. I'll be back on Sunday for Hell in a Cell, but... 
Saturday, we got off the script part one, and then Sunday will be part two. That's the new schedule. We will talk about Phil Brooks. We will talk about CM Punk. And hopefully, by the time I sit down and record this, we will have confirmation that he has accepted the deal to be on WWE Backstage on FS1, working for Fox on a WWE affiliated program. Should be interesting. I'll see you guys on Sunday. Until then, hit that thumbs up. And thank you guys for watching Off The Script. Have a great Saturday. And I'll see you right back here on Sunday morning for part number two.